Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. Today, there was a popular brand that tweeted out a snippet of code. Um, they were trying to say Happy New Year and be cute and write it in code. We sometimes see marketing groups do that kind of thing. Um, and it didn't work because it's not very good code. Now we can look at this code and we can dunk on it as people did on Twitter, myself included, or we can actually take a moment here and see what's wrong. It's not necessarily about reading each individual line and determining what's wrong. We also have to think about the context and what's called the implicit inputs. What are the inputs to this chunk of code that are not seen? They're not explicit, like we see that string on line one, but they are rather implicit, meaning that they come from the ambient context or from the operating system that we're currently running on. So let's break down what's wrong with all of this and we'll keep track of it in Notepad. And if you're an advanced C-sharp developer, an advanced developer, you're not gonna find this interesting. But if you are an early and career developer, you might find this interesting because this is something that we don't necessarily do deep analysis of um, in school. And you might say, how is there a lot of content? There's only eight lines of code here. Honestly, there's really only three or four, depending on how you feel about that else. There's not much happening here. How can we talk about it in depth? Well, it's complicated. The reason that it's complicated is because we're talking about dates. Virtually everything with dates is hard. Uh, comparisons, time zones, cultures, uh, time zones changing, new countries existing and disappearing, uh, time zones with half hour splits, um, date, time, the comparisons that occur and uh, across the comparison, the time zones change or the daylight savings times change. Um, over the many years that I've been a developer, I've bumped into issues where someone would do a time comparison, then daylight savings times would change and they'd do another comparison. So things changing in the milliseconds between two lines of code running. Dates are always complicated. Uh, as such, remember that dates are a data type. Almost everywhere they're a data type. You should be always doing work with dates as dates. Someone else has done the hard work for you. You should never, ever, never compare dates as ints, as strings, as anything other than a date. You should never manipulate them or parse them if you can avoid it. So let's look at line one right off the bat. We're saying if datetime.now, meaning the time it is currently, and then we're saying two strings. So we're say, taking now, datetime.now, which is a thing, and then we are turning that into a string and then comparing it to another string that looks on its face like January 1st, 2022. Let's take a look at that. Let's actually take that first line here and then let's put that on its own line. And we're going to say console uh, dot write line. I'm going to put that datetime dot now string right there. And I'm just going to put a breakpoint here. That way I'm going to hit F5 in Visual Studio and we're going to run line one and then we're going to stop. That way we're going to see the output of what line run line one does. Okay. So here you can see that it's 4.44 and 44 seconds. What a wonderful coincidence there. Uh, here where I am on the West Coast of the United States on 1-3-2022. Now I'm learning something already by running that. Line three, regardless of the person's intent, could never have worked ever. Where? On a person on the West Coast's English, U.S., configured machine. So there's a lot to parse there. Let's deal with that. First, we see that they were assuming 01 slash 01 slash 2001. And we see that when we output datetime.now.toString, we don't get what are called leading zeros because toString by default uses a number format, a number format that is built into Windows. Windows has a thing called region settings. So if I go into my region settings and explore those things, uh, it's usually deep into regional format. You can see here, short date does not include leading zeros. And when we say to string, it's going to use that format. So that's an implicit input. That's an implicit input. Let's think about that. Implicit input. So we think that the input here is uh, is really just that hard-coded string on line three, but in fact, an implicit input from my operating system is 
my current culture. Now in my case, my current culture is ENUS, English in the US. Yours may be EN, you know, CA, or it may be, you know, Sinhalese, or it may be Singapore. I don't know where you are, but all I know is that it's an input I need to be aware of. Okay? That affects the format of that date time coming out as a string. So that's one thing. The other thing is the time zone. What time zone are you in? Now in this case, dot now is the current time zone, the ambient time zone. So we're getting this value. If we stop this and we change it from dot now to dot UTC now and run it again, we're going to get a different time zone. You can see here that it's actually the fourth and it's tomorrow now suddenly, right? So when we ask that question, hey, what, you know, it's first of, first of January, congratulations. Uh, Happy New Year. What did we mean? Did we mean where you are or did we mean at UTC or the universal time or what they call Zulu time? So that was a question. As a general rule, when you are doing date time comparisons, you need to ensure that they're on the same time zone, but ideally you'll always do date time comparisons and date time math uh, with UTC or universal time. You'll never want to compare time zone ones. And you want to think about as you're passing date times around, what are you, uh, what time zone is, is implicit and what culture is implicit. Now, ideally, we would not be doing the comparison as a string, but I want to point out that this never could have worked. It never could have worked. And again, let's remind ourselves why not. It never could have worked because even at midnight, it would never have included leading zeros on the date. So the string comparison is itself incorrect. So we probably wanted to do something that's more like if date time dot now and then compare it to another date time. So then the question is, where would we get that date time from? Right? We can't just pass that in. We'd have to go and parse a date time. Well, the parsing is then an input. Just like two string makes a date, parsing consumes a date with implicit inputs. Parse it with the knowledge of the system that I'm on and the time zone that I'm in. Will that parse? Probably. Um, but would it help parse somewhere else? Here's a question. Is that the month or the day? Is that month, day, year? Or is that day, month, year? Sometimes you'll see MM, DD, YYY. And a lot of people will complain that the U.S. does things with month, day, and year, and the rest of the world does day, month, and year. But the correct way to think about strings are a thing that's called ISO 8601. And I'll leave that as an exercise for you to Google for. But typically, you want to think about dates as strings in this format. But we are not going to do that. So the question would be then, do I parse this, parse it reliably? I could do also what's called parse exact. Or I could go and make a date time. I could go and say make a new date time and literally pass in the year, the month, and the day, et cetera, et cetera. And then I compare two dates against uh, themselves. In this case here, you'll notice that this is taking in year, month, and day. Then I would want to confirm if I don't pass in the time that this is in fact midnight that I'm going to get by default, which I believe it is. That would be more correct uh, if we were going to do that. And that does acknowledge the current time zone. Again, implicit, implicit inputs. So you're going to want to think about that. So that's that was wrong. So we understand that there's implicit inputs there, there's time zones, time zones, and there's culture. There's nothing wrong with the initial console.write line. But there's two interesting things going on here with line seven. Let's see if you can see them. Okay, I'll give you a little bit of a hint. First, we have a string. We have our opening string with a double quote and an ending one here. This is called an escape. That is not required. That is actually not needed. This person who wrote this may have been a JavaScript programmer. The single quote would have been just fine. It's not required because the string there is being done as a double quote here and a double quote there. If it was a double quote, then I would want to escape it. That string was not required to be escaped. Now, this one is subtle. I've shown it to two senior engineers. 
uh, and they've all seen it. I was talking to, uh, to Safia Abdullah today and I said, hey, what's wrong with that string? And she said, that ellipsis is making my eyes go like this. This is a bit of, an, uh, of, a, bit of a stretch, but I believe that the person, probably the marketeer who wrote this chunk of code, wrote it in Microsoft Word. They wrote it in Microsoft Word and, and they typed dot, 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 and then it got converted into a Unicode ellipsis, a Unicode ellipsis. So Unicode, Unicode ellipsis has its own character for dot, dot, dot. It is one character, one glyph that contains in it three dots. And that's done for spacing reasons. So here are three, one, two, three individual dots, and you can actually see the white space around them. You see how the white space around this one here has some leading white space, and, and the last one has trailing white space? When you convert that into one character, that is now officially an ellipsis, but it's not three dots. Doesn't really matter, but it definitely made both me and Sofia go, that feels weird. So that showed us uh, that this person had copy pasted that code from Microsoft Word into their string. Again, is that a big deal? I don't know. Depends on how you feel about that and what your intent was. But it's an interesting thing that two engineers both saw it. Let's go and run that code side by side and see what it looks like because it might render differently than you would expect depending on where you choose to render it. Look at that. Isn't that weird? That could be a font issue. That could be that the Unicode glyph is not available there. But either way, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to look. It's probably not the intent for us to, uh, to output that the way that we were outputting it. So that did not look correct at all. All right. So maybe a little bit deeper analysis than you would have expected, but we can definitely guarantee that this was not really good code and there was a couple of things that were going on there. Considering dates as strings, never a good idea. Date comparison should always be date to date. Avoid conversions to ints to strings. You're almost always going to get it wrong. If you do end up parsing dates or outputting dates, if you can output them as ISO 8601, you will be better off. That's a more complete uh, format. Typically, you want to store dates internally, move them around as dates, and just at the last second when you show it to someone, you do the conversion, and that conversion could be to the uh, culture-specific local date that that person prefers, or it could be um, to the format that they want, but you never want to store it in the user's format. You always want to store it as a date. And then do consider your implicit inputs. What are inputs that you can't see? Current culture and time zone are things that are set on your computer. So you might have a situation with a date where it works on my machine, but then when I put it on a server, it doesn't work because the server is not in the same time zone or the server is set to UTC and I was doing everything on local time. That is the thing that you can bump into a lot. So uh, fun, interesting, cute little marketing uh, tweet, but it didn't work out uh, the way they expected it because uh, they didn't run it by somebody with a little bit more experience. Hopefully you find this to be a useful but fun and short analysis of three to four lines of code. Um, if you enjoy YouTubes like this, please do check out my other YouTubes. I've got tons and tons of stuff on this channel. Please subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.